Hello and welcome to the Make Ideas Reality Podcast. I'm Justin, aka The Garage Avenger. Taking a leap of faith and trusting your gut takes courage these days, but it used to be standard operating practice. Intuition and instinct kept humans safe for thousands of years, but we've evolved. We've learned to lean more on data, discrediting our gut as dangerous. My guest today, Jonathan Jameson from JJ Leathersmith, who has honed his intuition over the years, shares his journey of finding himself stranded in Mozambique, trusting his gut to use the last amount of money he had in his pocket to make a leather backpack of all things, and how that decision ultimately changed his life forever for the better. Jonathan and I also talk about the advantages of trusting your gut over your head and how you can build those gut trusting skills by implementing some small techniques into your daily routines and life. Man, if you are not inspired by this podcast, I fucking give up. So buckle up people and get ready to get inspired. And let's do this. Today's guest is a Canadian living in Ecuador making stunning leather craft that one really can't ignore. Once a bicycle mechanic dedicated to keeping the pedals turning, he found himself unhappy and knew there was more to life than earning. On a quest for happiness, he became stranded in Mozambique, but he trusted his gut even when things looked bleak. Now selling his leather craft across the world, the map to his success was suddenly unfurled. Welcome to the show, Jonathan. Jameson from JJ Leathersmith. Thanks a lot. How's it going? <laughs> good, good man. It's nice to have you on the show. Yeah, it's good to be here. Super yeah. good to be. So today we are talking about trusting your gut. Um, now, Jonathan has a really cool story that I'm hoping that he's going to share with us. And you know, we've all become sort of accustomed to using logic and, and using our calculated and learned responses from whether it was education or our upbringing to make our decisions. Um, but often this inevitably leads us to playing it safe. And, you know, if you have any dreams or ambitions, you know, this could be your advantage if you learn to use your gut instead. Now, um, hopefully Jonathan will talk us through uh, his amazing journey and how he's used his gut ultimately to lead him to success. And hopefully we're going to also learn some tips and tricks uh, and some tools maybe you guys can use to help you guys use your gut a little bit more um, and hopefully fulfill your dreams and and um, purpose in life. <laughs> but uh, before we get into that, I thought I'd give Jonathan a little chance to tell us a little bit about himself and what he does. Um, take it away, Jonathan. Yeah, thanks a lot, Justin. That's cool. Um, so to give a little bit of a, a idea of what I do, um, I have a brand called JJ Leathersmith that's definitely built in the roots of quality craftsmanship and quality materials and just sort of good, honest uh, products. So we make handmade leather stuff and we make it to last. And we've been doing this since 2012. Um, I also have really strong interest in in a lot of materials, not just in leather, uh, also in brass and and wood and stone and and a bit of everything. Um, so I definitely love the the creativity of both um, being an artisan, but also um, being a designer and then designing business as well. All of those sort of uh, the creative uh, aspects of, of those come together nicely in, in what we do here. Yeah, and, uh, and like I mentioned in the intro, you're a Canadian, but your your business and everything runs out of Ecuador. Is that right? Yeah. So, so yeah, I'm Canadian. I'm originally from the East Coast of Canada, Prince Edward Island, super small island. Um, sort of nestled there uh, in the Atlantic Ocean. In Canada, small population, uh, definitely sort of uh, reputation of craftsmen and, and people, your name is who you are. 
um, your reputation is really important. I sort of brought up on on that small community attitude. Um, the town that's closest to where I'm from is there's three thousand people in it. That's about uh, sixteen kilometers from home, <laughs> so everybody knows everybody, and everybody knows what you do. So, yeah, um, I found myself in Ecuador about six years ago, and there's about a two year period in between Prince Edward Island, Canada. And then Ecuador that we'll probably get deep into a little bit today uh, and how I ended up from from there to here. Yeah, I'm looking forward to to sharing that story with uh, the listeners. Now, you like I have to be like when you first sent me a message, um, I was like, who is this guy? Like, what, you know, like, (laughs) what is he kind of what's what's his story? But one thing I, I, of course, I went straight on your Instagram profile. And the second I went on your profile i was like holy shit this is fucking <laughs> beautiful like this work is gorgeous it's, it's so simple but like it looks completely professional obviously like i had no idea that you did it for a living <laughs> but i mean like it is like and i just have to give kudos to that i mean i i was blown away by some of your work by the way i, I just i thought wow this guy's got something so of course you know and you, you mentioned a little bit that you were living in Ecuador. So I, I thought, okay, well, we better get in touch. So here we are, guys, talking about uh, trusting your gut. Yeah, awesome. Thanks. Thanks for, uh, thanks for that. It's always nice when people appreciate what we're doing. And we do, do put effort into our work. And um, we're in the studio right now. So if you hear some hammering or on cue, <laughs> if you, you hear a bit of noise in the back it's because we're we're in production right now um there's three of us in the studio right now i'm chatting and and they're working away so yeah nice now we're going to be talking about trusting your gut now the reason why we're talking about this as we've discussed before is i think you've got a really cool story to tell about how you got into doing leather work and how you end up in ecuador um so i thought we'd start this whole journey off um when you were working as a bike mechanic in canada yeah so i um i worked as a bike mechanic for about at that point it was seven years i had been working as a bicycle mechanic and that i got into bicycle mechanics because i rode bmx back in the day and i was pretty serious about that um trying to you know we were putting out uh, video clips and DVDs back in the day and hawking them at competitions. And, um, it was kind of the center of my life bikes. And I dedicated a lot of my energy into becoming a quite good bike mechanic. Um, back in the day, and the, the goal was sort of to own a bike shop and run a, a local bike shop and sort of have everything in that, that world, uh, my work and my, my pleasure and my travel and, and all of that. Um, so as I said, at that point, I had dedicated about seven years to, to the craft. And I definitely thought of bicycle, bicycle mechanics as a craft um, and all the detail, the science and the art to it. But what happened was, I guess, is it seems to happen to a lot of us. We work really hard towards a goal and we get to a point where we're achieving certain things. You know, I had a pretty good reputation as a mechanic. Um, I was earning fairly well and I was doing a bit of other work. I was keeping bees at the time. I had some of my own bees. I was working for other people and I was doing all the things you're supposed to. I think in the the six months before I left Canada, I had doubled any of my yearly incomes from the years before ever, um, just in those six months before leaving Canada. So financially, I was doing pretty good. but I didn't feel very happy. I was, I was wasting most of that money. You know, I was partying a lot or uh, just going out, just trying to fulfill certain, certain things in my life. And that, that I guess I wasn't getting from, from the life I had built for myself at that point. So I ended up, um, I ended up getting to the point where I didn't know what I wanted. You know, I, I was achieving what I was thought I had wanted, but by the time I was getting there, I didn't really feel any fulfillment. I felt very unhappy. I felt lost. 
And I don't know why I did it. I don't know what made me decide to, to take that chance. But I had a two week vacation and I decided just to, just to, to pack my bag. In the evening, I decided I, I was just going to stay around for those two weeks. I wasn't going to go travel. And just one sec. Yeah, terminaste. Yeah. 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 So they're hammering, hand hammering rivets. There's <laughs> the anvil there pounding beside the head. So I don't know why I I took I don't know why I took that risk, um, but I decided basically to to just do a hitchhike tripping trip across Canada with no plans of really where I was going. Um, after we talked the other day, I started thinking about it, and I was like, before I left, I decided that night at sunset, which probably would have been like I don't know eight o'clock at night or something that I was going to leave in the morning. So I went home and I ran a batch of moonshine through the still, boiled off the moonshine, distilled off the moonshine, took a bottle for myself and gave another bottle to a friend. And in the morning, I started hitchhiking west. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and it was all this like very, very quick thing. And I don't really know what made me made me do it made me be like fuck it i'm out of here i don't know where i'm going but like i'm not happy with what i'm at i'm just gonna peace out for a bit and see what happens but it was probably because i was really fed up with where i was and realized that i knew what i didn't want um so i basically just just headed west and it seemed i'm not gonna get too deep into the details but it seemed that every time um like i was thinking there was something i wanted or needed throughout that trip and everything sort of fell into place it was very much like walking on this very clean beautiful path and everything was quite easy and that was a new feeling for me i f i felt like what i was doing before i was definitely feeling this like struggle and if i was like reaching my goals or getting to the top of the mountain i was trying to get to i was like bushwhacking it to get there and i was like arriving cut and bruised and tired and hungry and then all of a sudden like shit, this stuff's easy. Like I'm meeting these really amazing people day in and day out. I'm getting this ride to the town. It just so happens the person was going right beside where I wanted to go. And, and I start to take notice of that. It's like, what is happening different now in my life that it seems like the universe is providing these things for me. It definitely made me think of that line from uh, the alchemist. I don't know if you've read that book or not, but I remember he says something about them the universe conspiring to uh to help you or something like that the universe yeah. conspiring to help you mm. and and that definitely was like ringing in my head i was remembering that that quote because that's how it felt it felt like by me taking that little bit of a chance and be like i'm gonna hitchhike and do this like crazy little two-week adventure to like chill out a bit and, and de-stress it seemed like the world just started giving me all these really nice little little snippets of life these little enjoyable moments that i was i really really liked and and on that trip i ended up fine ended up going canoeing for about a week in the back country in canada in the wilderness like going from one lake to the next lake you have to carry your canoe from each lake canoe across and then you get to a little trail and there's like maybe 50 meters or hundred meters or three, 3000 meters. It could, it, every trail is different. You have to carry your canoe and your food. And I remember on that trip, I really went out there trying to find some answers and I had all these questions, but I didn't really know like what even the questions were. I felt very frantic and very on, on, not much focus. And I remember even in the canoe, I felt that way, like paddling out there on a solo canoe trip. My strokes were even not that, that smooth. The canoe was really hard to push through the water. And I remember sort of thinking to myself, beating myself up, like, why can't I think clearly? Why can't I like get into these moments um, that I want to be getting into to start processing certain things that the questions I had in my mind. And I remember maybe on the third or fourth day, it was just like, whew, and like all the superficial thoughts that were in my head, 
like, am I hungry or, or I don't know, just my mind racing. It all just calmed down. Hmm. And it felt like at the same time, I get into a rhythm paddling as well. And I started to think about certain things. I was thinking about love and I was thinking about life and I was thinking about expectations as well. And I start to dwell on this idea of expectations. And I start to think that, that maybe expectations like caused a little bit of trouble in my life. And that like I had worked really, really hard for a number of years to get where I wanted to go. And I got there, but, but it wasn't actually what I wanted. And I think having the expectation or choosing one thing out of the infinite amount of possibilities that exist we're maybe fooling ourselves a little bit to think that we can, we can make a decision that specific. And that's definitely what I was doing before. I was being like, this is the one, one place I can be in my life that I have to get there and I'll be happy, <laughs> which is so silly. And so I ended up like starting to think that expectations, they basically only can bring well, there's a couple of things I thought they could bring. They could bring you to the wrong place because you had decided without all the information you needed. And, and then they also just sort of lead to disappointment. And then I couldn't understand how they help us. So I started to, to try remove expectations from my life as much as I could. And I'm not saying that like you can't hope for something. I think it's really important to hope for things and have things that you would like to happen. But I think that, um, having general goals and sort of broad directions um, helps us uh, helps us to come across opportunities that we never knew existed. And that's how I sort of ended up after this two weeks of this little adventure, I ended up deciding to, well, yeah, it's been, now it's been like eight years, I guess. But at the end of that two weeks, I decided to basically sell everything. And what I couldn't sell, I gave away. And what I couldn't give away, I burnt. <laughs> <laughs> and, and bought a one-way ticket to Europe. Um, so you end, up, you end up in Europe. And you know the next part of your journey, I guess, um, from what you told me, was you know, you started sort of trusting your gut a little bit more and, and you know, speaking more about what you felt was going to be right for you and not dropping those expectations as well. Um, and you end up getting on this big bike trip, which is apparently hard to get on. Do you want to talk about a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so I find myself in Europe not really knowing what I'm, I'm going to be doing. Um, One-way tickets, no real plans, not very much money to last for a long time. It was definitely like throw yourself out into the world and see what the world gives you. Yeah. Um, at that point, like I, I was pretty, I was sort of fed up of the bike industry. I was tired of it. I still loved bikes very much so, but I was feeling that there was something not, not quite right there. And a few months earlier, even before I took this, this trip, I had applied for this job on a whim. It's this four month bicycle trip from Cairo to Cape Town, 12,000 kilometers <laughs> biking through the outback of uh, Savannah of Africa. And I didn't think there was any way I was ever going to get the job. It's this like amazing um, tour. It, I don't know. They probably have thousands of applications for the, the position that I was applying for. Um, but sort of out of the blue, they wrote me as I was on this like crazy adventure of, of just sort of opening myself up to the world. And, and they're like, Hey, we, we would like to like do an interview. We saw your applicator, or your, your CV, your resume. And they're like, let's do an interview. So we go through the first interview and I think we go through two more interview, two interviews and everything's going good. And then eventually I get this, this message being like, actually, you know what? Um, uh, we don't have enough. We're not going to have enough riders on the tour to justify having two mechanics. Thank you for your interest. Um, maybe try again next year. <laughs> <laughs> Son of a bitch. And I had this like, I don't know, this like crazy sort of feeling inside this like urge or this something that was telling me like, no man, like you're going on that trip. Like there's no way around it. You're going on the trip. And 
I actually remember getting back from, from the pub and reading the email and it was sort of that first gut response is just to write them back. And maybe that was because I had a few beers. Now that I'm thinking <laughs> <of them. laughs> yeah. um, and your intuition maybe comes through a little bit uncensored when you have, <laughs> have a couple it, beers. I'm, trusting I'm your beer gut. gut. <laughs> 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 Moral of the story, trust your beer gut. <laughs> and I wrote them back and I was like, um, yeah, thanks. That's great. Um, I'll go for free. <laughs> Just I'll go for free. Tell me I can go pay my plane ticket. I'll be there. And um, and they wrote me back, I think, pretty quickly, if I remember correctly. And they said, you know what? We just had a couple couple people sign on to the tour last minute. And this is like a month before the tour starts or something. It's like or a really short amount of time before the tour starts. And they say, yeah, we can justify two mechanics. Um, send us your bank account information. We'll do the, the deposit for the plane tickets and um, your pre-tour insurance and all the things that you need. They, they paid for that. And it was this sort of, I remember getting that message back and be like, what in the hell? <laughs> like, how am I getting this? And I, I just had this really strong feeling that it was because I was following my gut. And I felt like that by me following my gut, the universe is like, I'm going to help this guy out. Like he's doing his part. I'll do mine. Yeah. And I definitely felt that. And then that's how I ended up in Cairo. And then uh, we did this really amazing, uh, difficult, uh, spectacular, <laughs> painful bicycle tour where we were between 80 and 100 guests. And then I think we we're 14 staff, this huge caravan moving from the north of Africa to south of Africa, um, which made me experience a lot. I came into contact with a lot of interesting people. I remember there was a driver on the, on the tour. He was from Zimbabwe. And with him, we talked a lot about energies and, and uh, intuitions and, and little signs in the world like, I think there's things that we can see that are happening and we can give a bit of meaning to them. Maybe there's no meaning to it at all, but it helps our process, our thought process sometimes. Um, and I start paying attention to these little signs. And it seemed like the more I paid attention to those little signs, the more my intuition would be like, give me a meaning to those little signs. And each time that I would do something um, following my intuition, I would just be surprised of like how maybe abundant the world was like uh, with opportunities and just be like, wow, this is a really crazy opportunity right now. And it sort of gave me a little bit of confidence on that, on that intuition front. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then I guess I ended up, I ended up in, uh, in Cape town. And along that time I had been working a little bit with leather. I'd made some like little tobacco pouches and, and when I was in Portugal, I made a couple journals. My first thing that I made was a, a journal cover uh, because I was writing a lot, trying to figure my shit out. Yep. I had these moleskins that were just getting tattered in my backpack. And I decided to make a leather cover. So I went to a, um, an old thrift shop and I bought an old purse, leather purse. And I remember spending like a, a day taking the threads out and on sewing the entire thing. And it's just like a super simple, I have one here that's one that I make now, but it's just like super simple leather wrap. And I like wrap string around the moleskin so they stayed in it. And then when someone saw that, they're like, oh, that's really cool. Can you make me one? So I'd made a couple small little, little leather items that was like fun to do, but I was just playing around as a hobby while I was traveling until I got to Cape Town on the bike tour. And then I ended up in Cape Town and the bike tour was sort of over at that point. Um, and I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do. And so, our pre, what's that? So, so you're trusting your gut here. Like, oh, what am I going to do? Well, I'm just yeah. going to see where this is going to end up. Because <laughs> it was a one-way ticket, right? You didn't have a ticket back back to Europe yeah. or back back to Canada after this trip, right? Yeah, exactly. They, they gave me a one-way ticket and... We had like um, we had a pay, but it was pretty minimal. It sort of cover your your very basic cost of living. It's the job, especially for the first year mechanic. We're pretty like dime a dozen because, um, like I say, there's probably thousands of applications. Everyone wants to do it. Um, people like myself are willing to do it for free. Yeah, uh, 
these tours, I think people pay like fifteen or sixteen thousand dollars to do the tour. So there's lots of people like myself who are looking for adventure. I think after they 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 develop the relationship, they pay a little bit more. But as for your first year, you don't earn much. So I had finished the the bike tour in Cape Town, and with my tips from from the people on the tour, and then the small amount of pay for the last two months, um, I had like. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fly home. I'm gonna go buy a ticket with this money. And I'm gonna fly home. And we talked about this in the pre-pod, and it was, it was kind of interesting your comment about it. I had looked at it, and I think it was like the flight home was like fifteen hundred dollars or something, fifteen hundred and sixty-seven or something like that. So whatever the number was, and and I was like eight bucks short, <laughs> whatever it was, <laughs> I was eight bucks short. And I remember thinking like, this is a sign from the universe that I'm not supposed to go home. And you had mentioned in the pre-pod, you're like, that's crazy that your mind would even like look at it that way. Cause other people would be like, oh, I'm so close. Like I can do, it. I don't know. Like a hundred percent, man. I think most people would have been flipping out. They're like, I'm $8 short. What? I think they would have gone begging in the streets to get eight bucks. So they could like scrabble their way home. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I think people most people wouldn't be able to deal with being eight dollars short to a, like getting back home to their comfort zone like do you know what i mean like i think that's that was a big difference between you and and most i think in that situation you thought about it like exactly opposite it's like well yeah <laughs> what else could i do besides going home <laughs> so where did that end up putting you like the fact you, you obviously didn't fly home did you not with that money. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. So I ended up like, I took a couple of weeks that were really nice and in Cape Town because like we worked our asses off. When you're, when you're on a tour, you're the first person up and the last person to sleep every day. And that wears you out. Uh, so like getting to what I felt like coming out of the jungle or coming out of like the desert and then getting to Cape Town, which is this like amazing city with beautiful modern food and just like a really really amazing spot right i enjoyed it <laughs> i bought a new pair of pants and a new t-shirt <laughs> with part of my 15 dollars and or my 1500 dollars. and but then it was sort of like what next like what, what's going on and and i just kept following this these little signs um a friend of mine was going to be in johannesburg and then another friend hit that I met in the hostel was like, yeah, I'm going to Johannesburg. And then I, since I heard those two things within a day, I'm like, it's a sign I should go to Johannesburg. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> I ended up going to Johannesburg. And then I had some other friends that were going to a music festival in Mozambique. So I decided to go to the music festival as well. Um, but I ended up like getting lost and not knowing how to get to the music festival and showing up late. And then just like couldn't find the city that it was in and ended up in the capital of Mozambique. And by this point, it's been like a month and a bit or maybe, yeah, maybe a month and a half or something. I can't quite remember, but my money was starting to get down. Maybe I've spent a third or two thirds of it or something. Um, and I spent a little time in, in Maputo in the capital of Mozambique. And then I decided like I need to start moving and I start walking because I just don't know what I'm going to be doing. So what else do you do when you know, you just move? I love I, this. That you just started walking. I just <laughs> like, I think that's like the, like most people would have freaked out. Most people are like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just going to sit still. But no, you just like went for all, just, I'm just going to walk that way and see what happens. <laughs> I think now after our conversation last time and, and the more I think about it, the more I think movement has a lot to do with, with, um, opportunity and by keeping, keeping things moving, you're, you're changing things up. You're spicing things up. You're introducing more elements. And, and that's what I decided. I'm like, well, there's nothing here for me. So I'm going to start walking. I don't <laughs> like, I could walk East or I could walk West or like, I, I don't fucking know what's around. <laughs> So I just start walking north along the coast. And along that way, I ended up um I ended up meeting some people because I had been working with leather. I had been sort of keeping my eye out 
looking to buy some leather. And in South Africa, I, I saw some people working with nice leather, but I never found a source to buy it. And I was sort of always asking around. And uh, I remember uh, I ended up like I had this really terrible backpack that was super uncomfortable. It was like this big backpack. And I'd been dreaming about making myself my own like gigantic 60, 70 liter like traveler backpack. I had like really rudimentary sketches in my, in my notebook, uh, in those old moleskins that I still have. And I see this like this sort of like little hut where there's some people like carving wood and there's probably some people making some instruments and there's a guy making very, um, traditional English briefcases out of leather. And I remember just walking up to him and asking him, like, hey, do you know where I can buy some leather? Like, I'm, this is what I'm doing. I'm, I'm traveling and I'd, I'd like to make myself a backpack. And he's used to selling to tourists and that's sort of like his thing. So he said, yeah, sure. But he gives me a like, super high price. And, and I remember just being like, ah, uh, yeah, okay, that, thanks, but, but I'm not going to be able to afford that. And I thank him for his time and I'm starting to leave. And there's a guy sitting there sculpting. Uh, he was sculpting ebony wood, actually, like this really beautiful black ebony wood. Yeah. And he's like, hey, man, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, I'm traveling and, and I want to make myself a backpack, but I wanted to buy some leather. And the stuff he showed me is really nice, but I can't afford it. He's like, ah, yeah, well, give me your number. I'll, I'll find you some, some leather at a good price. So I give him my number and I keep traveling and I keep going. And I thank him and I keep walking and I walk for a few more days and just following the coastline, really beautiful coastline. It's like just people live there. Just normal people, people who fishing boats and, and just like really down home, good people. I was walking along and I ended up finding an old train and I hopped on this old train, something like, I don't know, like super, super old. It didn't have any windows anymore. They didn't stop in train stations. They would just stop alongside the rail or like on the rail. And then everyone would have to jump, jump off from the boxcar down. They would like be throwing off bales of um, product, products and stuff. <laughs> and I took that train up and where the rails ended is where I got off the train and just walked towards the beach, which I ended up finding a spot where I can pitch a tent. And I was sleeping there and sort of being like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. My money's dwindling. I'm getting down to like a couple hundred bucks at this point. And the phone rings and it's the guy that I had met a few days or a week or two before. And he's like, yeah, how you doing? <laughs> Jonathan, how are you? <laughs> like, I'm good. He's like, I found your leather. Really? That's, that's great news. <laughs> 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 How am I going to pay for this? And I asked him how much it's going to be. And it was going to be like half of what I had left at that time. And I had to make all my, make my way back to where he was. And I had this like internal debate inside me because my gut was like, make the backpack, make the fucking backpack. Like you've been dreaming about this for, for so long. You've been sketching about it. Like there's something inside you like do it. And then there's the other side. It's like, you're going to spend half your money on, on making this backpack that you don't even know how to really work with leather. Are you insane? Um, you're stranded in Africa. Like, what the hell are you doing? And I remember, I remember sort of the rational side of me being able to rationalize it a little bit, being like, whatever, you're going to be broke in two weeks or you're going to be broke in a week. Whatever, man, just spend the money. But what ultimately made me make the decision, I started flipping coins and I pulled this coin out of my pocket and I flipped the coin and it's really weird because I, I go flip it and it felt like the side it was going to land on. I really was wishing it would land on the side that I wanted. And it did. It landed on go back and make the backpack. And that was sort of... That was sort of a part of the training that I went through with myself of starting to follow my intuition more because I would get this gut feeling and I would flip a coin, it would land on the same side. And I started to realize this like connection because my gut feeling would always, even though it sounded kind of crazy in my own mind to do these sorts of things, 
they, they ended up working out to sort of a spoiler alert, <laughs> but I ended up um, hitchhiking back down the coast and then getting myself uh, a little bit of leather. I, I met them at that same, that same huts and, and the guy had a motorcycle and he said, hop on the back of the motorcycle. And they're like hugging the back of this guy. And we're driving through these crazy busy sort of highway roads. And then we pull into streets and then we pull into like alleyways. And then we pull into like, like crevices between two buildings where you can like walk through. And, and it's always like, I don't know, something you would see in Aladdin or something like these. Like, that's what I, there. that's what I was thinking about this. I was like, this is Aladdin. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember like hugging him on the back of the motorcycle. And at one point he turns on one of these little alleys and there's a whole bunch of mirrors like leaning up against the doorway where someone obviously has a, um, a mirror shop. And I remember seeing my image, my reflection, and then like all the other people around us and me like hugging him on the back of the motorcycle with my backpack <laughs> and just being like, this is insane. <laughs> this is so crazy. And it like opens up into a little courtyard and we get off the motorcycle there. When I say courtyard, it's like a couple meters wide. <laughs> it's like just like it's an open space. And there's just like a labyrinth, just like a maze in every direction. And he takes me into the leather shop and there's leather hanging up over all of the walls. And just by chance, that he ended up taking me to the spot where they, they were making or selling vegetable tan leather, which brought me to now, like everything I do is with natural vegetable tan leather, which is sort of like the stuff you would find in, in saddles or old work boots, like yep. good high quality stuff. That's, um, it's like produced responsibly. It's not full of crazy chemicals and stuff. Um, but he could have showed me some other type of leather and I would have bought it and worked with that and never known the distant, the difference. Mm. It brought me to this. So I remember like, he's like, yeah, this is the leather and, and you'll need this tool to sew with. It's like a little sort of like hook that you do a lock stitch with. I didn't even know how to do a lock stitch at that point. Like I had no idea how I was going to sew this thing. <laughs> and he's like, here's some string. And it just happened to be like really good quality waxed can or waxed uh, polyester string, braided wax polyester string. Um, some nice dyes. He's like, buy this, this, and this. You can make your backpack. And I'm like counting out my money, <laughs> paying for it. Uh, yeah, you've committed to it now. Just like you're doing it. Mm. And and I buy the leather, and I'm holding this roll of leather, sitting on the back of the motorcycle, and we do the reverse trip back. And uh, we get back to the the his little market area, the little like sort of cabins that they had there and he's like man where are you gonna make this like, i don't know probably sit in the beach <laughs> figure it out and he's like no no you can stay here it's safe and and uh, you can stay here and he showed me how to do the, the stitch that they use on for fixing shoes uh it's a very simple lock stitch same thing the sewing machine makes but with we were doing it with a thick uh, string which is very much similar techniques that we use now uh, he showed me that he did the first like four on the backpack. And then I did the next 2000. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, just by the kindness of that guy, um, it sort of brought me to, to learning how to work with leather. They, I remember the, the guy who was working with leather. He didn't really, he said hello to me. He was nice to me, but he didn't teach me anything. It was a sculptor that showed me the stitch. And I basically had a space where I could work, but no real guidance. And I just started doing it. Like, I'm not sure how I'm going to make this backpack, but I laid out all the leather and I took like masking tape and like marked it all out, like mapped it out, the cutting. I have no idea what I was doing. And then I cut it with a, with a, just a razor blade or whatever and a ruler. And I remember like maybe on the third day, I was working like uh, 10 hours a day morning to night and on the third day i have this like pile of leather with a whole bunch of holes in it <laughs> like some parts sewed together i'm like i have no idea what i'm doing and i just spent half of my money on this fucking thing and it's gonna end up being a pile of scraps and i can't finish it is what i was thinking in my mind but then the other part of me is like you're fucking finishing this thing like how can you not finish it my hands are bleeding because i'm not used to stitching 
and I just, I, I pushed through as, as you talked about in, in that podcast with grit, um, just like, like muscling through. Um, and I ended up finishing the backpack on the seventh day and it was crazy. I was so happy and just like such a relief to have this new backpack. And I put all my stuff into it. Everything fits. I have a little like water bottle holder that fits a wine bottle perfectly. Mm -hmm. And there's a little like spot where a corkscrew fits in perfectly. And one of the guys that I met that became a friend carved me this nice little map of Mozambique with, um, out of ebony wood that we sewed on the side of the backpack. I was just like so proud and happy. And I, I make my way back, um, to the other town. I thank them and I go and I get back to the other town. And within like a day or two of making my backpack, I'm like, I'm out of money now because I'd spent a week making this thing. For like a few dollars, basically. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm happy as can be. <laughs> um, in the, the town I was staying at, where I was sleeping on the beach, there's some like street vendors that were selling uh, like beads and necklaces and trinkets and stuff to the very odd tourists that would came, come by because this isn't a tourist place in rural Mozambique. Like there's nobody around. Mm. And one of those guys, Ended up being like, hey, man, make me a wallet. You got some scraps of leather, make me a wallet. So like, I make him this little wallet and I charge him a few bucks and I'm, I'm stoked. I can buy some bread, a dozen pieces of bread or something. <laughs> How far out? <laughs> and, um, and then there was like, I guess there, was, there must have been some sort of like mini conference or something, but there's some people from the southern countries of Africa meeting in a hotel that was close by and there's a couple of ladies walking past and they're like, so do a double take this like white guy sitting on the street, like on the concrete, cutting up leather, making stuff. And I have this amazing leather backpack. It's beautiful. It, it turned out really nice. It's a piece of crap, but it's really pretty. <laughs> and, <laughs> and they're like, sort of take notice and they're like, what are you doing? And before I could really even answer or even know how to answer, these guys are used to selling my, the friends that were, they ordered the wallet and they start selling for me. They start like, yeah, he's this great leather worker and he makes this amazing stuff. Look at this backpack. What do you want? <laughs> and they start selling for me and um, they end up selling a purse and a, a notebook or something. They end up selling like a couple of things. And I was able to make enough money to, to buy a roll of leather. And I would have charged them like a couple dollars because I had no idea about like how to sell stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm happy with like a cup of coffee and bread at this point. So they, just by the luck of meeting those guys, they were able to sell my stuff for a little bit more money than I would have, a lot more than I would have asked for. But that allowed me to buy a roll of leather. And once you have material, then, then you can be making more. And when you're traveling, if you've ever done any backpacking around countries, like could be in, in Asia, I think it's the same thing. And in Africa and Latin America definitely is that way. You have a, a visa that's worth maybe 90 days or 30 days. And it's always like, okay, my visa is running out. I need to move. So I had been there now coming on a month and it was, I had 30 days. So I had to be getting out and I had like, just as I was finishing up the last of those, those things and last of those orders and made enough money to buy leather. I had like a couple of days to get the hell out of Mozambique, <laughs> but I had enough money to buy that roll of leather and pay a visa into uh, one of two countries. And I don't know, something in my intuitions, like you, do not go back to South Africa. Don't go back to South Africa. And right at that moment in time, there was this like rebel uprising happening and Mozambique sort of narrows into a corridor for a few hundred kilometers. And that corridor is, um, is controlled by sort of uh, guerrilla, um, like uh, rebels, I guess. There's basically rebels, yeah, like a militia. No. And they had just at that time had some sort of conflict with the government and they started uh, shooting passenger buses off the road and burning, um, burning transport trucks and sort of shutting all that area down. So 
obviously the logical part of my brain is like, you can't go there. Like you have to go back to South Africa. But my intuition's like, you can't go back to South Africa. Don't go back to South Africa. Um, so again, I flipped the coin. It said, go north, go, go through the war zone, basically. Hitchhike through the war zone. <laughs> and I did it. Um, and I ended up hitchhiking through and getting picked up by this really nice guy. And I'm like really worried the whole time. Like, are we in the war zone yet? Are we in the war zone yet? <laughs> um, but we ended up getting to an area and the military had shut it down. So you couldn't go in. And they made us sleep there. And in the morning, like crack of dawn, they did a convoy of like a few hundred cars and like armored vehicles. And they climbed up with these, like not assault rifles, but like, like big guns, the huge guns. They climb on the top of the transport trucks. Yeah. And we end up driving through this, like 200 kilometers of rebel territory. It was like cars still burning alongside the road. And we went like 120 kilometers an hour. Once the convoy got moving, it started slow. And once it got moving, it just fucking floored it the whole, whole way. And, and I was able to eventually get through there and then get to the Zambian border and cross over and, and pay for my visa to get in. And I entered the country with, I remember this number, I entered in the country with a roll of leather my visa paid for and seventeen dollars. <laughs> <laughs> oh, far out! And in my mind, I was like, "All I need to do is get to a tourist area, and I will be fine." Because that's what happened. Like, I, I had this like good fortune of making my backpack and then instantly becoming a leathersmith. Like, I had orders from the first day or from the second day, basically. Mm. So I had this, like this confidence. And I'm like, okay, if I can get to a tourist spot and sit in the street, then, then I'll, I'll be able to, to make a little bit of money. And I ended up, I ended up making it to, to Livingston. I hitchhiked down. I was hitchhiking a lot. All, basically everything I was doing at this time was hitchhiking. And some people have picked me up hitchhiking and had a friend of a friend who lived in, in Livingston, which was in this Victoria Falls, this very famous, uh, tourist town. And, in Mozambique and Zambia, it's right on the border. It's amazing waterfalls. And they have a friend of a friend who lives there and they're like, ah, oh, you can sleep at his house. <laughs> so, so I remember meeting him and they're like, I meet them and they're in party mode. When I meet them, they're all drinking and <laughs> standing around the car. But it turns out that um, he lives in like the ghetto, pero, but like the, the ghetto. <laughs> um, yeah, like people from there don't even enter into this part of town. And I remember being there and not knowing for like the first few weeks or month that I was there and like saying hello to all the neighbors. And it's like where all the major crime is based. <laughs> but everyone but, treated me so well. But they're looking at you, they, they, you, they're looking at you going, you've only got 17 bucks. Don't worry about him. Like he's, he's not worth robbing. <laughs> yeah. But that, my intuition told me it was a good place to be. But if I had have listened to like everyone, you can't be there. Like, um, I definitely wouldn't have went there if I had listened to the rational side. But I just had a good feeling about it. Uh, you were making decent having, money there, though, weren't you? Like in the end. Yeah, basically from the beginning, I, I was making pretty good money. I stayed there in the ghetto for a bit, and then I ended up um, renting my own spot after I started making a little bit of money. Um, I found just a small, a small part on the street where um, there's street vendors that were selling stuff. And I went out of courtesy and they're like, Hey guys, like, this is what I'm doing. Um, I, I work with leather now. <laughs> I'm now a leather smith and I, I want to go home. <laughs> so I'm trying to make money to, to buy a flight back to Canada. And, yeah. uh, I'm going to find a spot where I can sit and work and. Just a courtesy, like if there's other leather smiths around or other people working leather, I, I don't want to step on anyone's toes. And the f basically the first person I talked to in the market, 6 a.m. the first day I was there, I was like, you know what, dude? Here's a spot right in front of my, my, my spot. You can sit down there. You can sit there. You can work there. Nobody will bother you. <laughs> do what you need to do. Oh, how amazing is that? Super amazing. Super amazing. And that's what I did for a couple months and a few months. I had three months that I could be there. So just shy of three months. Mm -hmm. I sat there and was working with leather and 
And I ended up making like pretty decent money considering how much I was spending on the place I was renting. And, and uh, I was comfortable. I was able to buy my ticket out of Africa. I flew to Europe and then flew to Germany and then hitchhiked from Germany to, to England and then from England back to Toronto and then hitchhiked from Toronto back, back home. Um, because I wasn't making that good of money, but I was making <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I was like, it obviously wasn't good enough just to get into the flight. <laughs> so, uh, but it, it, was, it was okay. Yeah. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit because I want to make sure that people get value. So, you know, you told me in the, in the pre-pod, basically you got restless after being in Canada for a couple of months and, you know, your friend said, hey, come to Colombia and you you ran over there the next second like i don't think you said the next day wasn't it you bought your ticket and and then you're off and then you tried to to make a living there but it did, it really didn't work you know it wasn't the same as mozambique or zambia like you you couldn't sell the stuff um mm -hmm. the market wasn't there so then you put out a post on facebook you borrow someone's camera <laughs> you don't even have a camera to, yeah and then you put a post on Facebook and then all of a sudden you get people back home saying like, hey, I'll buy one. And you set up Etsy and, you, and they've got a good postal system uh, there in Colombia, uh, being so close to the US uh, trade relations and stuff, I'm guessing. And yeah. you start your business. Now, <laughs> how did you go from Colombia then to Ecuador? So the same, same sort of thing that happens as you're a backpacker at that point, I'm still a backpacker in my mind. I'm like, I'm just hoboing around and my visa's running out. So it's like, what do you do? You go to the next country. So at this point, like I had worked quite hard for a few months, I think of six months in Colombia, And I started like coming up with some good designs. And I wasn't just doing one of pieces where I slap something together, sell it in the street and then slap something else together. I was starting to have actual templates and, and designs that I was developing and following and then photography online. And so it was becoming something real now is sort of solidifying. And so I, I hop down, I can afford a bus now. <laughs> so I pay for the bus and, and I do a mini trip from the north of Colombia down into, into Ecuador. And just on a, a sort of a small piece of information that I heard one evening in the, in the plaza talking to someone, they said there's a small little town in the mountains in Ecuador where there's a tradition of working with leather. Hmm. And as I'm coming down through Colombia, Etsy's like, ding, ding you got an order and then like a few days later ding ding you got another order so i'm i'm writing to people hey i, I got i'm on a two-week vacation and like i'll get your stuff to you really quick and like yeah no problem so i enter into ecuador and i'm like i need leather i need leather and i need to rent the house for a month where i can fill these orders and ship them out and i ended up going to this small town which is about 10 minutes away from where i live now and I ended up meeting, um, going to a tannery, just like a very, very small family tannery where there's the father and son making leather. And I buy a little bit of leather and I, I start making the, I start making the orders that came in and more orders come in <laughs> and I start to get to know Ecuador, which is, I didn't even know anything about Ecuador before coming, like, nothing <laughs> at all about Ecuador. And uh, Ecuador is this amazing uh, country where it's the Amazon region. So you have the headwaters of the Amazon River. Um, you have beautiful Andean mountains. And then you have this amazing coast. And then Galapagos obviously is here as well, which wasn't obvious to me at the time. I didn't know that. And it's the Andeans. The Andes are just full of volcanoes. It's like beautiful scenery. And I find this tiny little town in these mountains and i start to get to see all these uh, hiking trails and rivers and, and lakes and i start to fall in love with with the countryside as well so i start to think like okay maybe maybe a month could be a bit longer maybe maybe it could be six months so i start to build a little bit of furniture I'm like okay i need a work table 
orders are coming in. I'm going to hire another person. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think like arriving to Ecuador, as, as I said, at one point, I thought I was going to spend a month or two and it's, it's been six years. Like how that hitchhiking trip was going to be two weeks and it's been eight years. Um, just being open to, to the possibilities and recognizing things that, so when opportunity comes, being ready to, to accept it and, and take advantage of it. And like having your expectations sort of limited or, or fluid, I guess, um, allows us to take advantage of these opportunities that maybe we otherwise wouldn't if we had have been a little bit more rigid in, in what we want for ourselves. And now we're, we're here in the studio. Um, we're like in full production for, for Christmas. Um, yesterday I shipped out a bunch of product to the States. Uh, things are moving and shaking. It feels good. It feels really good, actually. And I never thought I would have been a leather worker living in, <laughs> in Ecuador, speaking Spanish. Um, yeah, I never would have imagined any of that before. Yeah. It- I kind of feel you a little bit because, you know, like if you had told 15 year old me that you're going to be living in Norway, speaking Norwegian, you know, growing up in Sydney and, and, you know, that there's no, I didn't even know where Norway was. Like, I'm pretty sure the first time I was flying there, I was like, where is Norway? Where? Like, I I had no idea. Um, what did you think that like, the advantages of trusting your gut over logic have really fundamentally been for you like in in just do you think you're like overall happier person yeah (laughs) (laughs) i mean the the amount i listen to my gut is definitely like it correlates to to my like well-being in life and the less i'm listening to my gut the it normally seems like the more stressed and unhappy I am and stuck, definitely stuck. I don't think there's many people out there that would have spent the last, you know, half of their money on a to to make a leather backpack of all things. Like like you could have made <laughs> you could have made a backpack out of just normal fabric, but you wanted to make a leather backpack which you had no idea how to sew. Like it's quite technical. It's not like it's not like you had any machines or anything like you could have like done it easily with. But you just you chose to do the hardest, probably the hardest thing like I could imagine to make a backpack out of. Like I'm gonna make a leather backpack. Like oh my god, mine's gonna be fucking awesome. This thing's gonna be so nice. (laughs) Um. I would say though, like your story is really unique. Um, you know, there's there's like a lot of, you know, unrelatable stuff to people. I think because most people, just like myself, right, where you know I've got my my house, my cars, and and my workshop, for example, and and my my family, and my kids, um, and I'm thinking I can't like up and leave and just go like backpack or hitchhike or like that doesn't work right um and you know obviously you understand that as well i was wondering if you had any maybe tools uh you could maybe share with us maybe some ways people can like start you know getting to learn to know what their gut feels like or you know ways of thinking that will realign you to to like understanding what your gut's saying to you yeah, I wish I was an expert on this because I would apply it to myself. <laughs> um, but definitely, I think there's a couple of things that, that that one can pay attention to and think about when they're interested in intuition. And part of it is is movement and, and changing habits a little bit because intuition comes out when we're making decisions. So um, if you're in a routine, you're making less re- less decisions. So. If you're a woodworker, maybe going to a different supplier, just like buying your your wood from someone else. And then that's going to open up a whole set of new interactions that you wouldn't have had because it's not sort of habitual. Yeah. And just try try changing things up a little bit and and what you're doing. And then and then listen to 
start trying to pay attention to when you change it up. There, there's going to be like, or for me at least, there's this sort of two voices. One that's an intuition and one that's very, very similar to an intuition, but isn't. <laughs> and it's hard to tell which is which. <laughs> and, but I think the, the more you start listening to it and identifying it, the easier it starts to get. And then paying attention to the feedback. So if you feel like you have this gut feeling like there's a sign there that says, um, uh, let's stay with the woodworker. So there's a, a sawmill that I never noticed that there was a sawmill on this left turn. I'm going straight, but I just saw the sawmill sign. I'm going to pull off left, just pull off left and see what happens and go into that sawmill that you've never been to before. Talk to the guys. The dude might have a tool there that he's trying to sell and you've just been looking for. You yeah. only went because it was like maybe this little sign and your gut told you to do it. And you thought maybe you could buy some wood and you end up taking home exactly the tool you've been looking for is kind of obscure. And that's sort of a tiny example. I don't think it needs to be these big things where you sell everything you own and you buy a one-way ticket and end up being homeless. <laughs> yeah. That's not necessary. Um, and even that applies to me right now in my own life. Like I, I got roots down. I have a four-year-old daughter. I have a workshop. It's amazing. I have a business and I have people that are relying on on me to pay their bills or pay their, their wages. And so it's just an, our conversation is a nice reminder for me to help me try find, find these things in my day to day as well. And I think it's just putting yourself in a situation where you're, you're breaking your routine and you have to make a decision that you, you normally wouldn't be making. And then listening to, to the parts of your body, parts of your mind or your body that are telling you these, the, the two different, the different decisions that you could make, the different possibilities. Start paying attention to them. And I think it gets stronger. Would Would you say like I feel like often the word want and should like the should is definitely like a, you should never listen to that one. <laughs> like and and the want is always something that you should start listening to. Um, often, like I think where you said like that intuition can be like uh mistaken for something else uh that's either like our ego or something else along those lines where like for example i i really want to like for example start i don't know like making a really cool thing in my garage right mm -hmm. um but it might be an ego thing that's driven driving that mm -hmm. like i i might want to do that big project because i feel like you know it's going to get me noticed for example rather than i'm actually gonna like solely enjoy this project so i think that's something that i like i feel i'm still working on like sometimes i'll go into a like a, think about a project and I'm like am i doing this project to like get noticed or am i doing it for myself because mm -hmm. I think that's something that I think, you know, you'll be unhappy in the end if you keep on doing it to be like, you know, to be found, to be seen for what you're doing. Like you, there's no doubt that you might be able to pull it off and do it. But it, you know, I think if, if we're talking about the macro goal, not the micro goal. is just about, you know, having a good life and happiness. Then those projects that you take on should really reflect that macro goal. And that is often in my opinion at least the fact that you should do a, the 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 projects you really feel are something valuable for yourself rather than for others yeah definitely yeah definitely i think it, it is a hard one to to tell and for me that flipping the coin and then feeling what my my gut was like i wanted to land on this side <laughs> that was like that um I wanted to land on this side was, was basically always my intuition. And that was a way for me to help identify which was which. And um, because when I'd flip the coin, I would never want it to be landing on the, like either the ego side or the, the safe side or the fear side. It was always that, like sort of crazy adventurous and everyone's different. I think like each one of us have to play, play with it a little bit and start listening. And, and I really do think that movement, and lack of routine, uh, something that f facilitates um, a connection with our intuition, at least. And then I'm not sure how, how each one can start 
figuring out how it works, but at least building that environment, uh, I think is a really good step forward. Yeah, I think it's really, I think like the good takeaway I can get is like, just try mixing it up. It doesn't matter how small it is, just mix up your normal routines. Um, you know, like you said, go to a different wood supplier, for example. I love that. So simple, right? But often mm -hmm. we'll just use the people we know, right? So, um, yes, you might get screwed over, but then also you learn to lesson. You know what I mean? Like that might, that might put you in a new direction because you got screwed and you didn't have the money. Like, for example, like maybe you got bad product or it cost too much and then you didn't have the money to, to do a certain thing. So you find a new solution, which ends up revolutionizing the project. Right? You, know, you just don't know where it can all end up. And I think like, I love the flipping the coin thing. I think that's really cool. Like I'm, I'm probably going to start doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know how it goes. Anyone who, who starts flipping coins, anyone who's listened to this, I would love to hear some experiences from this. It's something I just sort of randomly started doing and I stopped uh, quite a while ago. I don't flip a coin anymore, but uh, maybe I should start. But I started seeing that people are, are making these really cool coins. So I think it's something people are doing now. This is like these worried coins or something people are like, Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I have a feeling I'm going to start doing some. Maybe I'll, like, maybe I'll have a coin, like a specific coin. Definitely. It's like fucking do it on one side or like... <laughs> You lose or something like oh, that. We, we have a new product. <laughs> Fucking do it on one side. Yeah, but let's launch a, a community. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> you, could, you could have some leather inlays just for you, mate. <laughs> well, we work really close with this, um, with the brass foundry. So we forge our own buckles and mm -hmm. um, make our own designs. So that would be amazing to, to do a drop of some nice forged, um, brass coins on one side so fucking do it on the other side like don't bother or like or or go listen to make ideas reality <laughs> podcast <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> <laughs> go go, go re-listen to to that that episode <laughs> um i'm gonna launch right i think straight into the rapid fire five and wrap this thing up are you ready awesome all right Fill in the blank. Creativity is fluid. Why do you say that? Because it comes when it wants, and it goes when it wants. You can't contain it. Well, you can contain it, but it's just like this weird thing that just sort of flows in and flows out. It's like not maybe not forced, and I don't know. It's, it just feels like that's not something I thought a lot about, but that's how it it came out. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Uh, what's something people get wrong about you? Uh, what do people get wrong about me? Um, here, they call me American a lot, which I'm not. <laughs> I think I'm American and I'm Canadian. <laughs> uh, what's your favorite thing to do when you're not like making product and, and being creative? Um, camping, hiking, camping with my little one. As I said, I got a four-year-old baby girl and she's a little adventurer too. So I got like a little seat that goes on my bike and we go on like bike packing trips and stuff. So that's super fun to do. And then that also incorporates photography, which is really fun. Just taking photos of, of people I care about. So those two things together. The seat's made out of leather, right? Yeah, of course it is. <laughs> <'Cause> it is. <laughs> um, do you have a project that's completely priceless that you'd never sell? Yeah, for sure. That first backpack that I made, uh, people have tried to buy it a lot, and it's been everywhere. There's been like a million dogs piss on it as I'm like selling in the street. <laughs> like I'm sitting there selling, and I like turn around, and my backpack sitting on the ground, some dogs pissed on it. <laughs> That thing I will, I'll never, never sell. And the same thing with my my first journal that I ever made. No, no way. Oh, no freaking way. Yeah, I, I think, I feel like after this podcast, you're going to have to post that picture of that backpack up on your Instagram just to refresh yeah, it. I'll, I'll refresh it for everyone to look at. <laughs> yeah, I'll uh, put it up for sure. 
Yeah. Um, and this is uh, the last question. What does what does happiness look like? Uh, I don't know. I've shifted away from like looking for happiness and look for peace more now. Um, so for me, I guess maybe they're not the same thing, but um, I think peace has a lot of value in life, and and for me, that makes me happy. <laughs> Uh, when I make decisions now, I definitely, I ask myself, is this going to make my life more peaceful or less peaceful? And, and sometimes I don't always follow the answer. I don't always go with the peaceful one, but I definitely try to incorporate that into my, into my decision-making. Um, for overall well-being, uh, happiness is peaceful. <laughs> uh I think peaceful is a is just another way of saying happy, in my opinion. Because when you're happy, you're at peace. I feel like, at least anyway, there's not those like, you know, those clashing ideas or friction there. Um, when you're when you're happy and and just enjoying life, I think it's good. Definitely. Um, I think this has been a great show. I like I love the stories. I hope you guys have got something from this episode. Like I feel. Like trusting your gut has to be something we probably have never talked about often in this in the maker community, like of how we trust our guts to like make decisions on whether it's projects or, you know, what videos we're going to make or whatever it is. And I, I hope you guys got inspired a little bit from from Jonathan's story um, and that maybe you can use some of the tools we talked about maybe even just flipping the coin or just mixing it up, um, whatever it is, I like I encourage you guys to get out there. Um, you know, if you want to get in touch with Jonathan, where can people find you, Jonathan? Um, JJ Leathersmith, anything. So JJ Leathersmith or Instagram, or that's the one I use most. Um, from there, you can find my WhatsApp number. You can call me up, shoot the shit, <laughs> whatever you want. <laughs> Um, Jonathan Jameson or JJ Leathersmith. Love it. Like, please make sure if you got inspired, let him know. Um, be and, so cool. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know I've been inspired. So, um, I just want to say thank you, Jonathan. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for sharing your journey with us. It's, uh, it's been inspiring. And, you know, like when I heard the, your story on our pre pod, when you went all in, we weren't restricted by an hour and a half of, podcast you know <laughs> i i was i was in or I, I think i remember saying to my wife when i got in I'm like oh i just had the most amazing guy come on my podcast <laughs> it's oh, gonna be so good. good but um yeah look i i really appreciate you coming on and, and thanks for your time yeah i appreciate it too and um we'll stay in touch for sure the conversation was amazing and i love to get into to chats uh where we can just sort of shoot the shit both of us about ideas it'd be really fun oh, i'd love it. it i'd love to and oh, I, one one day or another i will get to ecuador <laughs> yeah, you're more than welcome here. <laughs> yeah i would say the same you're more than welcome here in norway too um awesome, th man. thank you all so much for listening i hope you got something from this episode if you're not following jonathan please go check out the links in the show notes uh there you'll find everything you need to know about jj leathersmith um, if you want to be one of the cool kids and join the GA Nation, you can do so by heading over to Patreon. Otherwise, you can support me just as much and all the amazing guests that have been on the show and will be on the show in the future by making a dope Make Ideas Reality leather bag. Uh, whilst you're at it, you could also make a Garage Avenger leather bag as well <laughs> hint hint wink wink um <laughs> or you could just simply honestly like truly honestly just share this podcast guys like it means a lot more than you think you know you giving a recommendation to a friend or family of about this podcast uh would make all the difference uh to all my guests that are coming on this show and that have been on this show uh to get the platform that they deserve to be heard um, I'd love your feedback. Please send your DMs to at Garage Avenger on Instagram. Until next time, keep pushing yourself, keep ballsing up things, keep learning, get inspired, and I'll catch you on the flip side. Uh, we're out, man. We're done. 
awesome. Yeah. Super. Yeah. Yeah. Fun. yeah that, super was, fun. that was dope. Love it. <laughs>